Item number, SCP-054. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. Subject is held in a watertight isolation room, outfitted with specialized climate control equipment. An ornate fountain filled with water stands in the center of the enclosure. Maintenance personnel are required to wear NBC suits while inside the containment area, and must spend 10 minutes in a special drying room after exiting. In the event of a breach, the surrounding area should be evacuated and the enclosure flushed with liquid nitrogen. The fountain's chemical levels and volume are to be monitored and maintained. Spring water from should be used as SCP-054 is highly sensitive to hydrological conditions. SCP-054 has developed a mistrust for human males during its confinement. Thus, assignment of female personnel is recommended. Description Out of the water, the subject most often appears as a female humanoid, with a mean volume of 90 liters, comprised entirely of water. Other forms are possible, commonly geometric shapes. When it enters a body of water, it becomes indistinguishable from its surroundings. The subject must periodically return to a body of water in order to maintain its volume due to evaporation. Initially found in it was moved to Site-08 for further study. Subject was initially curious about Foundation personnel, and seemed to enjoy interacting with maintenance staff and researchers, and mimicking their forms. After a number of weeks, the creature apparently felt comfortable enough to remain out of the water during routine monitoring, though it retreated when attempts were made to study its composition. SCP-054 is apparently composed of normal water, with no detectable differences compared to ordinary spring water from the same source. No thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or other phenomenon has ever been detected in its body that would suggest how it animates. Water lost by SCP-054 to evaporation exhibits no special properties when condensed. Experiments with SCP-054 were halted following data expunged to researchers injured. After this incident, containment protocols were updated. Subject thereafter exhibited signs of mistrust and aggression around male personnel, which made up the majority of the original research staff. Subject reclassified Euclid. Partial transcripts. Audio Journal 054-A. Water loss experiment. Subject becomes withdrawn and inactive when denied access to water. Its compact shape is theorized to reduce surface area exposed to evaporation. For the first few days, it moved eagerly to greet anyone entering its enclosure, and behaved excitably. Possibly indicates an understanding by the subject that we control its access to water supplies. Subject ceased this behavior yesterday, presumably in recognition that no help was forthcoming. Temperature Extremes Testing We got authorization to attempt Sub-Zero testing this morning. The subject became lethargic as the temperature fell, and eventually froze completely. Spectroscopy of the ice crystal revealed no abnormalities. Ice chips were collected for study. This is in stark contrast to its behavior in the 95 degree tests, when it became aggressive and attempted to escape its enclosure. We've submitted a work order to combine the climate control equipment with the subject's standard enclosure, as it has begun to resist efforts to transport it to experimental chambers with increasingly desperate behavior. Memory and Conditioning Evaluation Subject has proven unexpectedly adept at navigating complex mazes and solving puzzles. Dr. Seskel has finally overcome the problem of motivating the subject by the application of electrical shocks and or silica desiccants. He joked that we should have it trained to fetch in no time, and after observing his methods, I think he might be right. Note: Subject to be allowed a 48-hour recuperation period. It seemed to be lagging in its progress at the end of the week's experiments. Acid Base Incorporation Experiment Last Log Entry I am starting with a 0.5 mole hydrogen chloride solution. I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. Temperature in the enclosure has been lowered to 278 Kelvin to help control 54's increasingly erratic behavior. Addendum 054B after five years with no incidents, subject rating has been downgraded to safe, on recommendation of Dr. Experiments will resume under the auspices of Biology Unit E7. Caution should still be exercised when interacting with subject. Item Number SCP-169 
Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Because of its size, SCP-169 cannot and almost certainly will never be contained. No structure on Earth is large enough or strong enough to contain SCP-169. The location of SCP-169 is not precisely known, but imaging satellites and analyses of eccentricities in the Earth's orbit suggest SCP-169 is located in the southern Atlantic Ocean, possibly stretching around the tip of South America. Any satellite footage of a shift in the land masses produced by SCP-169 is to be excised and destroyed by embedded agents. Description SCP-169 is surmised to be a marine arthropod of enormous size, known as the Leviathan, by generations of sailors and oral history. Presumed at first to be a myth, SCP-169 was detected in 19 by Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 during an investigation of paranormal activity around an undisclosed archipelago. During Gamma-6's investigation, Dr. Gamma-60912 discovered the archipelago to have moved at least three kilometers from its original location, though initially said doctor believed this motion to be due to unusually quick continental drift. A reconnaissance mission performed by the USS revealed the archipelago to be the protrusions of rock-like plates covering an enormous organic mass. The Foundation was brought in immediately to begin threat management. Dr. Gamma-60912 and Dr. Gamma-60421 estimate SCP-169's body length to be between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers. The creature is thought to have existed since the Precambrian era. No other specimens have been sighted. Almost nothing is known about SCP-169's habits, such as its reproductive capabilities, if any, food source, and nesting area, if any. Research regarding SCP-169 is pending approval. The archipelago known as the Islands have historically been uninhabited, though claimed by 17 Upon handover to the Foundation, their presence was evacuated on the pretense of rising sea levels. Though the archipelago has remained above sea level for several millennia, any change of depth by SCP-169 could result in the disappearance of the entire archipelago. SCP-169 moves slowly, less than one kilometer per week, but seems only to be adrift. Its method of propulsion is unknown. Regular seismic tremors seem to indicate breathing about every three months, causing minor shifts in the island's terrain, suggesting that the creature is probably dormant. Information Suppression The USS was scuttled with all hands immediately after the discovery of SCP-169, with the permission of the American government. The public is forbidden from entering the archipelago created by SCP-169 due to the conveniently large number of resident endangered bird species. As indicated above, satellite footage is to be doctored in order to suppress knowledge of SCP-169's movement. NASA is currently cooperating with the Foundation in keeping the existence of SCP-169 quiet and is currently permitting the Foundation use of their satellites for photographic use. Addendum 0-20 In 1990, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, an American scientific agency, unaffiliated with and unaware of the existence of the Foundation, detected an ultra-low frequency underwater sound emanating from an undisclosed location, approximately kilometers from the southwestern coast of South America. Despite the best efforts of embedded agent IA-1522, news of the sound leaked to the media, receiving significant media coverage. Foundation analysis concluded that a massive underwater organism was the source of the noise, and SCP-169 was hypothesized to be its source, as its head is well within the possible locations of the rest of SCP-169. The sound confirms Gamma-60421's hypothesis that SCP-169 is gargantuan in size. Future efforts by scientific or civilian teams to determine the source of the noise must be stopped by any means necessary. Item Number SCP-252 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-252 is to be contained in a 150 cubic meter aquarium, reinforced with high tensile steel plating. Guards are to be specially trained in waterborne combat techniques and armed with Model B-74H harpoon rifles with high capacity electrical discharge shafts. The tank is fitted with 15 remotely activated depth charges, which are to be detonated simultaneously if a containment breach is imminent. A breeding pair is maintained under the direction of marine biologist Dr. Personnel should not approach the containment tank unless they have been previously prepared for the anomalous effects of the animals. Additional specimens of SCP-252 may exist in the wild. Current specimens are considered sufficient, and further acquisitions are not a priority. Containment of information regarding encounters will consist of Standard Cover Story 53, Drunken Sailor, and administration of amnestics as necessary. Description SCP-252 is a subspecies of Docidicus gigas. Mature specimens are noticeably smaller than average, reaching no more than one meter in length and weighing a maximum of 40 kilograms. Dissection shows the absence of an ink sac and an increased density of chromatophores, approximately 20 times the normal adult average. Behavior is identical in most ways to mundane specimens, except when hunting or threatened. When a member of SCP-252 detects prey, they exhibit aggressive behavior and move towards the target at maximum speed while rapidly cycling their chromatophores. This color shifting has a hypnotic effect on prey animals that make visual contact, causing them to cease all defensive behavior and attempts to flee until grappled. When threatened by a predator or otherwise agitated, SCP-252 rapidly metamorphs into an unidentified aquatic life form of extreme size, with an indeterminate physiology and extremely destructive demeanor. Physical attributes in this state are in a constant state of change. Size fluctuates between 50 and 75 meters in length, with no fewer than 50, and occasionally as many as 200 appendages of various natures. Appendages shift constantly between suckered tentacles averaging 5 meters in length, insectoid limbs terminating in barbed pincers, and humanoid arms and legs ending in sharpened talons. Details and positions of appendages on the body also vary randomly, with the only constant being a cluster of tentacles around the head, obscuring the mouth area. It is not currently known how this rapid growth is achieved, due to the potential for a containment breach. No research on the matter is currently authorized. All animal life, excluding other SCP-252 and mundane squid species, will attempt to escape the vicinity by the most direct route possible. This fear response can cause the targets to harm themselves as they flee into hazardous conditions or ram repeatedly into container walls. Roughly 95% of subjects encountering an enraged SCP-252 develop a phobia of cephalopods. It is not known if this is an additional anomalous effect or a normal behavioral reaction to traumatic experiences. Upon review of security footage during containment, Dr. Reed has determined that SCP-252's metamorphosis is in fact an advanced hallucination induced by the shifting pattern of chromatophores. These hallucinations cause the victim to see SCP-252 as a titanic sea creature with an excessively large number of tentacles. Specific details vary greatly from subject to subject, but the hallucinatory creature consistently presents as a greatly exaggerated cephalopod with tentacles clustered around the mouth area, additional appendages with talons or pincers, and the general impression that all features are fluid and randomly shifting. Subjects removed from visual contact with SCP-252 will remain convinced that their hallucinations were a real sea monster and will attempt to rationalize any logical contradictions inherent in their delusion, such as a 100-meter monster swimming in a 10-meter enclosed tank. This rationalization and the lingering phobia is thought to be a form of post-hypnotic suggestion. Subjects viewing video of agitated SCP-252 who have never been exposed directly experience a much less severe fear reaction and are able to perceive the squid despite the hallucinations. Subjects describe the illusory monster as fake-looking and nonsensical but still find it moderately frightening. After secondhand exposure, 
Subjects develop a partial immunity to the full effects of direct exposure. Repeated direct contact after inoculation by video further lessens the effects. Acclimatized subjects can develop a complete immunity to the fear effect and experience only the vaguest awareness of the hallucinations. Addendum SCP-252 came to Foundation attention after numerous reports of sea monster sightings by commercial fishermen off the coast of Agent secured a specimen at greater than usual personal danger. Commendation for performance above and beyond the call of duty recommended. Said agent allowed himself to be exposed to SCP-252's effects during first contact. Initial containment procedures were based on his reports of the specimen's size and physical capabilities, resulting in an excessive expenditure of resources. Disciplinary action recommended, pending oversight review. Item Number SCP-327 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-327 is to be contained within a 40 meter by 40 meter by 10 meter saltwater tank. Within sight, the tank is to be cleaned on a weekly basis or immediately after an algal bloom event. The walls of the tank are to be soundproofed. All staff interacting with SCP-327 or entering the containment are to wear sound canceling headphones. When not in direct conversation with SCP-327, any staff who report suffering the effects of SCP-327's properties are to be removed from active duty until cleared by a staff therapist. SCP-327 is to be fed 15 kilograms of lettuce and assorted leafy vegetables each day, accompanied by appropriate nutritional supplements. English language instruction for SCP-327 has been approved to be carried out by Drs. Amberley and Watson. Two hours per day have been allotted for this purpose. Description SCP-327 is a female specimen of a mammalian species, resembling members of the order Serenia, specifically Trichicus manatus, West Indian manatee, measuring approximately 2.8 meters in length and 450 kilograms in weight, and estimated to be between 25 and 30 years of age. The subject bears anomalous bodily features. The flippers bear distinct fingers and a functioning opposable thumb, and the skull and facial features resemble that of a human. SCP-327 was hit by a boat propeller five to ten years before retrieval, as evidenced by heavy scarring on the head and back, and traces of severe head trauma. SCP-327 is sapient and capable of speaking simple English sentences though it experiences significant difficulty in doing so, both in pronunciation and comprehension of concepts. SCP-327's anomalous effect is based around its primary vocalization, taking the form of songs, similar to that of cetaceans. These vocalizations are regarded as highly unpleasant to listen to and will result in severe headaches and audiovisual hallucinations in humans, persisting for 6 to 12 hours. Those affected will often report claustrophobia, an aversion to water and aquatic animals, and occasionally, sensations similar to that of drowning. Other mammals will experience the same effects. During vocalizations, algae and plankton within approximately a kilometer of SCP-327's location will reproduce at incredibly high rates. The resulting algal bloom will cause considerable oxygen depletion and neurotoxin levels in the area and causing mass die-offs of local fish and mollusk life. There are no anomalous properties present in the algae itself, and SCP-327 is immune to all effects caused by its vocalizations. Interviews with SCP-327 have revealed few concrete details of its origins, due to the specimen's inability to adequately express the information. SCP-327 has implied the existence of other specimens of the species to live in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. However, no anomalies resembling the descriptions have been reported. Addendum 1 Recovery Log SCP-327 was recovered in August of 2008 after a series of inexplicable mental illnesses amongst citizens of Florida and reports of unexplained noises in the area. The area had been under Foundation watch for two weeks, before it was reported that a mutant manatee had been washed ashore by Tropical Storm Fay. 
After investigation by Foundation agents, amnestics were distributed to the local populace, and the specimen was recovered without incident. Addendum 2 Interview Excerpt For purposes of readability, SCP-327's accent has been corrected in this transcript. Dr. Amberly Hello, 327. SCP-327 Hello, Dr. Ambry. 327 ready to answer questions again. Dr. Amberly. Very well. We were talking about the song yesterday. Could you tell me more? SCP-327. Yes. Song for fish and animals. Song for plants. Song for people. Song for home. Song is good. Song not like this. SCP-327 hums for three seconds. Song not like words. Song is song. Song make things good. Song not good now. Dr. Amberly. And what happened to the song? SCP-327. Low rumbling noise. In imitation of a motor. Made it bad. Dr. Amberly. The boat then. SCP-327. Yes. It is okay though. Bad song not hurt animals here. You and Watson help 327 get good song back. Item number SCP-118 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Due to the number and distribution of SCP-118, containment of every specimen is impossible. Known SCP-118 red zones are to be closed off to all civilian marine vessels and divers under the guise of a military presence or other plausible cover story. Contacts in navies known to operate near SCP-118 red zones are to be utilized in order to minimize the passage of military vessels through the red zones. If any area within the red zone has a depth of less than 1500 meters, the restriction is to be applied to aircraft as well. All human activity in surrounding yellow zones is to be monitored, and any non-military vessels or individuals approaching the red zone are to be turned away. In the red and yellow zones, protocol Toxic Harvest is to be followed to ensure the removal of devices generated by SCP-118. Furthermore, protocol Cell Watch is to be followed to ensure the early detection of any emerging red zones. Samples of SCP-118 can be stored using standard containment procedures for non-virulent anomalous microbes. Description SCP-118 is a species of ocean-dwelling protista that is capable of assembling functional, self-initiating nuclear devices from materials present in ocean water. While SCP-118 is unknown, and hence has not been classified by the scientific community, specimens resemble protists of the phylum Euglenophyta, but have significantly increased levels of movement speed, nutrient storage capability, and resistance to alpha radiation. Specimens of SCP-118 have been found in all of the world's oceans and seas. When in a survivable saltwater environment, specimens of SCP-118 will seek out materials including but not limited to iron, silver, copper, carbon, TNT, and uranium isotopes. When SCP-118 is located a material of interest, the material is absorbed into the cell using a method dependent on the size of the material. Single atoms and molecules, mostly substances that are dissolved in the water, are passed through the cellular membrane through specialized protein pumps. Larger particles smaller than the cell itself are ingested through phagocytosis. Larger pieces will have particles torn off through an unknown mechanism, which are then absorbed using the first two methods. This mining occurs even in solid and hard substances, such as metal ingots. Upon reaching a threshold of absorbed materials, Specimens of SCP-118 will move towards an assembly area on the bottom of the body of water they are present in, and will contribute to the assembly of a nuclear device. The nuclear devices assembled are gun-type fission devices, using uranium-235 as their fissile material. Observation of devices in the process of being assembled show that the process starts with the assembly of a metallic rounded cylindrical casing for the device followed by the creation of two subcritical masses of uranium and the conventional explosives to propel them into each other. The device is then finished with the assembly of a uranium-238 tamper, where the two uranium masses will collide, and the assembly of a trigger mechanism. 
SCP-118 appears to assemble the necessary components by adding minuscule amounts of material to an initially tiny material seed. Differing atoms and molecules can be added to the same component, and assembled components are not necessarily homogeneous. It is currently unknown whether SCP-118 builds on the seed atom by atom, or by adding very small sub-micrometer fragments. The mechanism by which SCP-118 attaches new material to the seed seamlessly is unknown. The assembly time depends on the size of the device being assembled, water conditions, and mineral availability. But observations suggest that 300 days for a medium-sized device can be considered average. Once a nuclear device is finished, SCP-118 will detonate the device by completing a circuit in the trigger mechanism. Around 90% of the nuclear explosions recorded as a result of SCP-118 have had yields in the 20 to 35 kiloton range, although yields as low as 4 kilotons and up to kilotons have been reported. Aside from cases involving human interference, failure to detonate has never been observed, as all nuclear devices recorded have either been detonated of their own accord or removed from the water prior to completion. Devices constructed by SCP-118 appear to be larger than man-made devices of similar design and yield, presumably due to the neutron-moderating effect of the water that separates the uranium masses throughout much of the device's construction. A given assembly area typically has between one and three devices in the process of assembly at any given time, although as many as six at a time has been observed. In zones where multiple devices are being simultaneously assembled, the devices are separated by enough distance to prevent the detonation of one from destroying or setting off the others. While the Foundation is unable to prevent civilians and other organizations from obtaining samples of SCP-118, its superficial similarity to existing species, few numbers, relative to all oceanic protista, lack of anomalous behavior outside material-rich bodies of water, and the Foundation's standard monitoring of scientific studies at risk of uncovering information about anomalous biological species ensures that the chance of SCP-118's true nature being determined through cell samples is minimal. There are currently six different active SCP-118 assembly areas known to the Foundation. While the natural disappearance of an assembly area has been observed, the current consensus among researchers assigned to SCP-118 is that elimination of assembly areas without massively noticeable effects is currently unfeasible. Thus, containment is to be established at SCP-118's assembly areas, to be designated red zones and surrounding yellow zones. Furthermore, areas with elevated concentrations of SCP-118, zones of interest, are to be monitored for signs of assembly areas. SCP-118 Containment Zones Red Zone lies within city limits. This, combined with the shallow average depth of Red Zone, the heavy shipping traffic in the area, the ongoing tensions between and a nuclear power, and the presence of Foundation personnel and facilities in the city, makes a nuclear detonation in this Red Zone unacceptable. In addition, heavy ship traffic through the area and heavy air traffic above the city make restricting access for any long period of time impractical. Addendum 118-1 Following the USS incident, the exclusion radius used when drawing red zones had been increased. Containment protocol Toxic Harvest has been updated. Addendum 118-2 With the signing of the Partial Test Ban Treaty and growing number and capability of nuclear detonation detection methods in use, the consequences of nuclear detonations caused by SCP-118 have increased. Containment protocols have been revised in light of these facts. Addendum 118-3 Due to the significant cost of containing SCP-118 red zones, the O5 Council has requested trials on possible methods to eliminate SCP-118 assembly areas. Red Zone Eradication Trials Summary Introduction Researchers with access to the files on SCP-118 are allowed to submit proposals to eradicate an SCP-118 assembly area with acceptable levels of collateral damage. The ones approved by Toxic Harvest Command and the O5 Council will be carried out. Trials are to be performed in Red Zone <laughs> Proposal Sterilization of unfinished nuclear device in immediate surroundings using a UV light emitter. Approval Approved Result Area around unfinished warhead initially free of microorganisms. However, SCP-118 concentration returned to normal levels within an hour. 
Non-sustained sterilization of sites seems ineffectual. Any method we come up with will have to keep the red zone, or at least the sea floor of it, free of SCP-118 for an extended period of time. Dr. Brandt Proposal Sodium hypochlorite pumped to ocean floor. Approval Denied Result N.A. The chemicals will disperse too much to be effective. Any amount sufficient to reduce SCP-118's numbers will cause massive ecological damage. Dr. Klaus Proposal Depth charge bombardment of ocean floor to break up under assembly devices. Approval Denied Result N.A. Aside from the fact this would break our naval budget, the chances of triggering the conventional explosive in the devices and causing a fizzle is too high. It would also make our activities even more detectable with hydrophones. Dr. Klaus Proposal Sweeping of ocean Using a Cobalt-60 powered directional gamma ray emitter Approval Approved Result While procedure resulted in the sterilization of swept area, procedure was far too slow to sterilize entire red zone before specimens returned. Keeping entire red zones sterile would require impractical numbers of emitters and vessels. While it's a shame the device cannot get rid of the red zones for us, I think it can be of use to our device recovery teams. The gamma rays can sterilize the devices we recovered to prevent undesired detonations during the recovery of almost complete devices. The gamma rays can also penetrate into areas where our current chemical and UV sterilization methods can't reach. Captain Thompson, RZ-3 Zone Commander Proposal a plastic membrane to block access to ocean floor at red zone. Approval. Proof of concept on one under assembly warhead approved. Result. First attempt was unable to acquire a watertight seal around warhead. Membrane in second attempt was too fragile for ocean conditions and was torn off its moors. Third membrane, manufactured using a thicker and sturdier design, had hundreds of micro tears ripped in it within hours possibly due to SCP-118's mining action. Not surprising, considering that SCP-118 has been known to wear through the casings of old artillery shells to harvest the explosives within. We had hoped that cutting off the assembly area would work better than cutting off the raw materials. Dr. Klaus Proposal Compound Pumped to Ocean Floor Note Proposed by Dr. Former researcher for SCP-118 currently working at one of the Foundation's chemical research divisions. Tests confirm that compound is lethal to SCP-118, remains concentrated at bottom of water, and degrades into relatively harmless chemicals in water over a period of 15 hours. Approval Approved Result Over one week, SCP-118 concentrations on ocean floor fell to 3% of previous levels. No signs of progress observed on two known uncompleted nuclear devices in Red Zone. However, 100 days after the start of the experiment, an underassembly nuclear device was detected 60 kilometers north of the Red Zone. Measurements in the area indicated vastly elevated levels of SCP-118, and the area around Discovery was reclassified as a Red Zone. Furthermore, the unexpected breakdown of compound by certain species of oceanic bacteria resulted in toxic byproducts that caused a noticeable die-off of fish in treated zone. Upon stoppage of experiment, Red Zone was observed to gradually migrate back to former location. It seems that making a Red Zone non-viable served only to move SCP-118's assembly areas to a new location. Nevertheless, perhaps if we can improve compound or find a new one whose application is more subtle, we can move Red Zones into areas away from areas of human habitation or commercial activity. Dr. Proposal Use of SCP Approval Denied Result N.A. SCP has classified properties that preclude its use in such a manner. 055 Conclusion Due to increased media attention to areas around one of Red Zone due to aftermath of the application of compound and the lack of proposals without high risks of substantial collateral damage, Testing in said red zone has been suspended. Addendum 118-4 Our research has determined SCP-118 enriches uranium by exploiting the fact that U-235 has a slightly greater preference for a high oxidation state than U-238. SCP-118 specimens which have harvested large amounts of uranium 
and her near assembly areas appear to develop specialized organelles resembling a series of thousands of vacuole like chambers, with mitochondria like organelles within them, responsible for catalyzing reduction and oxidation reactions. In a given chamber, uranium is repeatedly reduced and oxidized. Compounds with uranium in higher oxidation states are transferred up the chain of chambers, while compounds with lower oxidation states are transferred down the chain. This results in a small amount of highly enriched uranium at the very end of the chain. Researchers and engineers at Research Sector have managed to create a prototype uranium enrichment device based on the principles employed by SCP-118. While the prototype was unable to produce weapons-grade uranium without using unreasonable amounts of time, it was successful in producing reactor-grade uranium, albeit at significantly greater cost than conventional methods. Despite its current limitations, the idea shows promise, and I have forwarded our findings to the relevant front companies. Dr. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.